All this talk of primes got me hungry for primes. <laughs> you uh, you wrote a blog post, The Beauty of Bounding Gaps, a huge discovery about prime numbers and what it means for the future of math. Can you tell me about prime numbers? What the heck are those? What are twin primes? What are prime gaps? What are bounding gaps in primes? What are all these things? And what, if anything, or what exactly is beautiful about them? Yeah, so, you know, prime numbers are one of the things that number theorists study the most and have for millennia. Um, they are numbers which can't be factored. And then you say like, like five, and then you're like, wait, I can factor five. Five is five times one. Okay, not like that. That is a factorization. It absolutely is a way of expressing five as a product of two things. But don't you agree there's like something trivial about it? It's something you could do to any number. It doesn't have content the way that if I say that 12 is six times two or 35 is seven times five, I've really done something to it. I've broken up. So those are the kind of factorizations that count. And a number that doesn't have a factorization like that is called prime, except historical side note, one, which at some times in mathematical history has been deemed to be a prime, but currently is not. And I think that's for the best. But I bring it up only because sometimes people think that, you know, these definitions are kind of, if we think about them hard enough, we can figure out which definition is true. No, no. there's just an artifact of mathematics. So, yeah, we one, do. so it's, it's a question, uh, which definition is best for us, <laughs> for our purposes. Well, those edge cases are weird, right? So, uh, so, weird. so it can't, you can't be, it doesn't count when you use yourself as a number or one as part of the factorization or as the entirety of the factorization. Um, so the so you somehow get to the meat of the number by factorizing it. And that seems to get to the core of all of mathematics. Yeah, you take any number and you factorize it until you can factorize no more. And what you have left is some big pile of primes. I mean, by definition, when you can't factor anymore, when you when you're done, when you can't break the numbers up anymore, what's left must be prime. You know, 12 breaks into two and two and three. Um, so these numbers are the atoms, the building blocks of all numbers. And there's a lot we know about them, but there's much more that we don't know them. I'll tell you the first few. There's two, three, five, seven, 11. By the way, they're all going to be odd from then on because if they were even, I could factor out two out of them. But it's not all the odd numbers. Nine isn't prime because it's three times three. 15 isn't prime because it's 3 times 5, but 13 is. Where were we? 2, 3, 5, 7, 11, 13, 17, 19. Not 21, but 23 is, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so you could go on. How high could you go if we were just sitting here? By the way, your own brain. How, if oh. uh, Continuous, without interruption. Would you be able to go over 100? I think so. There's always those ones that trip people up. There's a, there's a famous one, the Grotendieck prime, 57. Like sort of Alexander Grotendieck, the great algebraic geometer, was sort of giving some lecture involving a choice of a prime in general. And somebody said, like, can't you just choose a prime? And he said, okay, 57, which is in fact not prime. It's three times 19. Oh, damn. <laughs> but it was like, I promise you in some circles, that's a funny story. Okay. Um, that's, what the, <laughs> but um, <laughs> there's a humor in it. Uh, but yes, I would say over 100, I definitely don't remember. Like 107, I think. I'm not sure. Okay. like I mean, So is there a category of... Uh, like fake primes that that are easily mistaken to be prime, like fifty seven. I wonder. Yeah, so I I would say fifty seven <laughs> and fifty seven and fifty one are definitely like prime offenders. Oh, I didn't do that on purpose. Sorry. Oh, uh, well done. I didn't do it on purpose. Anyway, they're definitely <laughs> ones that people. Uh, or ninety one is another classic. Seven times thirteen. It really feels kind of prime, doesn't it? But it is not. Yeah. Um, but so, there's also, by the way, but there's also an actual notion of pseudo prime, which is a which is a thing with a formal definition, which is not a psychological thing. It is a prime which passes uh, a primality test devised by Fermat, which is a very good test. Which if a, if a number fails this test, it's definitely not prime. Mm -hmm. And so there was some hope that oh maybe if a number passes the test, then it definitely is prime. That would give a very simple criterion for primality. Unfortunately, it's only perfect in one direction. So there are numbers, I want to say 341 is the smallest, uh, which pass the test but are not prime, 341. Is this test easily explainable or no? Uh, yes, actually. Um, ready? Let me give you the simplest version of it. You can dress it up a little bit, but here's the basic idea. Uh, I take the number, the mystery number. 
I raised two to that power. So let's say your mystery number is six. Yeah. Are you sorry you asked me? Are you ready? It's not no, I'm a, you're breaking my brain again, but okay. yes. Let's, let's, let's do it. We're going to do a live demonstration. Um, let's say your number is six. Yep. So I'm going to raise two to the sixth power. Okay, so if I were working that, I'd be like, that's two cubed squared. So that's eight times eight. So that's 64. Now we're going to divide by six, but I don't actually care what the quotient is, only the remainder. So let's see, 64 divided by six is, uh, it, well, it's, it, there's a quotient of 10, but the remainder is four. Mm -hmm. So you failed because the answer has to be two. For any prime, let's, let's do it with five, which is prime. Mm -hmm. Two to the fifth is 32. Divide 32 by five, uh, and you get six with a remainder of two. With a remainder of two. Yeah. For seven, two to the seventh is 128. Divide oh. that by seven, and let's see, I think that's seven times 14. Is that right? No. Seven times 18 is 126 with a remainder of two, right? 128 is a multiple of seven plus two. So if that remainder is not two, then that's definitely not then prime. Then it's definitely not prime. And then if it is, it's likely a prime, but not for sure. It's likely a prime, but not for sure. And there's actually a beautiful geometric proof, which is in the book, actually. That's like one of the most granular parts of the book because it's such a beautiful proof, I could not give it. So you, you draw a lot of like opal and pearl necklaces and yes. spin them. That's kind of the geometric nature of, the, of this proof of Fermat's little theorem. Um, so yeah, so with pseudo primes, there are primes that are kind of faking it, they pass that test, but there are numbers that are faking it, that pass that test, but are not actually prime. Um, but the point is, um, there are many, many, many theorems about prime numbers. Um, are there, like, there's a bunch of questions to ask. Is there an infinite number of primes? Uh, can we say something about the gap between primes as the numbers grow larger and larger and larger and so on? Yeah, it's a perfect example of your desire for simplicity in all things. You know, it would be really simple mm -hmm. if there was only finitely many primes. Yes. And then there would be this sim finite set of atoms that all numbers would be built That's up. That's right. From. That would be very simple and good in certain ways, but it's completely false. And number theory would be totally different if that were the case. It's just not true. Um, in fact, this is something else that Euclid knew. So this is a very, very old fact, like much before, long before we had anything like modern number that theory. primes are infinite the primes that there are that right the there's an infinite primes. number of primes so what about the gaps between the primes right so so one thing that people recognized and really thought about a lot is that the primes on average seem to get farther and farther apart as they get bigger and bigger in other words it's less and less common like i already told you of the first 10 numbers two three five seven four of them are prime that's a lot 40 percent mm -hmm. if i looked at you know 10 digit numbers no way would 40% of those be prime. Being prime would be a lot rarer, in some sense because there's a lot more things for them to be divisible by. Mm -hmm. That's one way of thinking of it. It's, it's a lot more possible for there to be a factorization because there's a lot of things you can try to factor out of it. As the numbers get bigger and bigger, primality gets rarer and rarer. Um, and the extent to which that's the case, that's pretty well understood. But then you can ask more fine-grained questions, and here is one. Um, a twin prime is a pair of primes that are two apart, mm -hmm. like three and five, or like 11 and 13, or like 17 and 19. And one thing we still don't know is, are there infinitely many of those? We know on average, they get farther and farther apart, but that doesn't mean there couldn't be like occasional mm -hmm. <laughs> folks that come close together. And indeed, uh, we think that there are. And one interesting question, I mean, this is... Because I think you might say like, well, why, how could one possibly have a right to have an opinion about something like that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> like what, you know, we don't have any way of describing a process that makes primes. Like, sure, you can like look at your computer and see a lot of them. But the fact that there's a lot, why is that evidence that there's infinitely many, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe I can go on the computer and find 10 million. Well, 10 million, 10 million is pretty far from infinity, right? So mm -hmm. how is that, how is that evidence? There's a lot of things. There's like a lot more than 10 million atoms. That doesn't mean there's infinitely many atoms in the universe, right? I mean, on most people's physical theories, there's probably not, as I understand it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so why would we think this? The answer is that we've, that it turns out to be like incredibly productive and enlightening to think about primes 
as if they were random numbers, as if they were randomly distributed according to a certain law. Now they're not. They're not random. There's no chance involved. It's completely deterministic whether a number is prime or not. And yet, it just turns out to be phenomenally useful, useful in mathematics to say, even if something is governed by a deterministic law, let's just pretend it wasn't. Let's just pretend that they were produced by some random process and see if the behavior is roughly the same. And if it's not, maybe change the random process, maybe make the randomness a little bit different and tweak mm -hmm. it and see if you can find a random process that matches the behavior we see. And then maybe you predict that other behaviors um, of the system are like that of the random process. And so that's kind of like, it's funny because I think when you talk to people about the twin prime conjecture, people think you're saying, wow, there's like some deep structure there that like makes those primes be like close together again and again. And no, it's the opposite of deep structure. What we say when we say we believe the twin prime conjecture is that we believe the primes are like sort of strewn around pretty randomly. And if they were, then by chance, you would expect there to be infinitely many twin primes. And we're saying, yeah, we expect them to behave just like they would if they were random dirt. You know, the fascinating parallel here is um, I just got a chance to talk to Sam Harris and he uses the prime numbers as an example often. I don't know if you're familiar with who Sam is. He uses that as an example of there being no free will. <laughs> Wait, where does he get this? Well, he just uses as an example of it might seem like this is a random number generator, but it's all like formally defined. So if we keep getting more and more primes, then like that might feel like a new discovery and that might feel like a new experience, but it's not, it was always written in the cards. But it's funny that you say that because a lot of people think of like randomness, uh, the fundamental randomness within the nature of reality might be the source of something that we experience as free will. And you're saying it's like useful to look at prime numbers as a, as a random process uh, in order to prove stuff about them. But f fundamentally, of course, it's not a random process. Well, not in order to prove some stuff about them so much as to figure out what we expect to be true and then try to prove uh, that. Because here's what you don't want to do. Try really hard to prove something that's false. That makes it really hard to prove the thing if it's false. <laughs> Yeah. So you certainly want to have some heuristic right, ways of exactly. guessing, making good guesses about what's true. So yeah, here's what I would say. Let's You're going to be imaginary Sam Harris now. Yes. Like you are talking about prime numbers and you are like, but prime numbers are completely deterministic. And I'm saying like, well, but let's treat them like a random process. And then you say, but you're just saying something that's not true. They're not a random process, they're deterministic. And I'm like, okay, great. You hold to your insistence that it's not a random process. Meanwhile, I'm generating insight about the primes that you're not because I'm willing to sort of pretend that there's something that they're not in order to understand what's going on. Yeah, so it doesn't matter what the reality is. What matters is what's uh, what framework of thought results in the maximum number of insights. Yeah, because I feel, look, I, I'm sorry, but I feel like you have more insights about people if you think of them as like, beings that have wants and needs and desires and do stuff on purpose, even if that's not true, you still understand better what's going on by treating them in that way. Don't you find, look, what you work on machine learning, don't you find yourself sort of talking about what the machine is, what the machine is trying to do in a certain instance? Do you not find yourself drawn to that language? Well, oh, it, I, it knows this, it's trying to do that, it's well, learning that. I'm certainly drawn to that language to the point where I receive quite a bit of criticisms for it because I, you know, like- Oh, I'm on your side, man. <laughs> so especially in robotics, I don't know why, but robotics people don't like to name their robots. Or they, they certainly don't like to gender their robots because the moment you gender a robot, you start to anthropomorphize. If you say he or she, you start to, you, you in your mind construct like a, um, like a life story in your mind, you can't help it. It's like you create like a humorous story to this person. You start to, uh, to <laughs> this person, this robot, you start to project your own. I, but I think that's what we do to each other. And I think that's actually really useful for the engineering process, especially for human robot interaction. And yes, for machine learning systems, for helping you build intuition about a particular problem. It's almost like asking this question, you know, when a machine learning uh, system fails in a particular edge case, asking like, what were you thinking about? Like, right. like asking, like almost like when you're talking about to a child who just did something bad, you 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 want to understand like what was, um, how do they see the world? 
Maybe there's a totally new, maybe you're the one that's thinking about the world <laughs> incorrectly. And uh, yeah, that anthropomorphization process, I think is ultimately good for insight. And the same as I, I, I agree with you, I tend to believe about free will.